Um, so first of all, Mark, I would like to thank you for inviting me to come today and um, my colleagues here, Dr. Irizarry and Tony Pearson, um, who are representing ASI and Pharma and um, Lilly in the pharmaceutical industry. But also, Mark, really, this has been a wonderful conference and um, all the speakers who are here, um, I'm learning so much and all the people in the room are learning so much from you and we hope during this panel that uh, you'll be involved um, in in this in this discussion but Mark really thank you he makes it look easy um, but what he's managed to do here today and in general with this program is something really very unique and special and um, he makes it look easy but he works very very hard at it so thank you for that um, so we are here today to talk about pharmaceutical industry perspectives on expanding African American enrollment in clinical trials. And um, I'm the founder of the Cognitive and Research Center of New Jersey, uh, which is located in Springfield, New Jersey. I'm a neuropsychologist by training, but I have a dedicated research practice where I do clinical trials that are predominantly uh, sponsored by uh, pharmaceutical companies. So you've heard a lot about clinical trials here today that have that are sponsored by NIH or NIA. A lot of um, what I do is sponsored by industry who we're going to hear from um, today. So um, really what I've asked um, our panelists to talk about is why is it important to increase our enrollment of African Americans in clinical trials? Um, I'd like each of them to tell you what their respective uh, companies are doing to increase African American enrollment and what the impact of those efforts have been. And um, as our third panelist, um, I would hope that you, the audience, um, can participate in suggesting what else can pharma be doing and um, what can we all be doing to increase African American enrollment in clinical trials. So a lot of what I plan to talk about in my introduction has already been very eloquently uh, presented, so I may go through it kind of quickly, but these are the facts and figures that have been published by the Alzheimer's, by the Alzheimer's Association um, about the rates and impact of Alzheimer's disease um, in our society. And with a focus on black Americans, we've already heard that they're twice as likely um, than older whites to have Alzheimer's disease. 21.3 percent of African Americans over the age of 70 are living with Alzheimer's. Um, 20 percent believe they have no barriers to excellent health care. And um, 55 percent think that significant cognitive decline is part of normal aging. Um, and black um, Americans represent a disproportionate amount of paid and unpaid um, caregivers and caregiving costs. So, um, I don't know how um, readable this is from where you're sitting, but um, there have been lots of studies um, about why uh, U.S. adults are not um, interested in participating in clinical trials. And um, black Americans are the most likely to say that they're not participating because they don't want to be a guinea pig. So 69% um, of black Americans compared to 49% of white Americans, which is still kind of high, right? 49% even in the white population. Um, and they are also more likely to say that they don't want to participate because they think the treatment may cause sickness. Um, so those are the top two reasons given. 
And we've already talked here today about mistrust among black Americans because of past injustices. And we really need to move forward on a very wide and systemic level in terms of being able to overcome this. And this involves uh, reaching people at a patient level, at institutional levels, at caregiver levels, community levels, um, all the different things that we've been talking about here today. And um, this has already been um, said by Dr. Hugh earlier this morning, but there have been studies um, looking at uh, really whether or not the participation of African Americans, I don't know why my slides keep advancing, I'm sorry, um, is lower than it is in other populations. And there, there is evidence in the literature that actually it's not true, um, but that African Americans have not been asked, um, and that if you ask them that they are as likely as other groups to participate. Um, so I'm here today asking everyone who is potentially eligible to participate in a clinical trial to please participate in a clinical trial. So now you can't say you haven't been asked. And ask your family members um, and friends because um, we need participation in clinical trials. Um, the biggest obstacle to finding a cure for Alzheimer's disease is the lack of participants in clinical trials. Um, it's, that's really what it is. So we need participants in clinical trials if we want a cure. Um, so why is it important to enroll more African Americans in Alzheimer's clinical trials? Well, I told you that based on the statistics, they're twice as likely um, to have Alzheimer's disease, but they actually represent um, less than 5%, probably closer to 2% of representation in clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. And if there's such a um, low representation in clinical trials, um, for all the different reasons that we've heard so far this morning, it's not clear if those drugs, and it's an exciting time to be in Alzheimer's research right now. We have several drugs, um, including by um, the companies represented here today, um, that have uh, monoclonal antibody treatments that have very promising data, some of which have already been um, approved by the FDA. And if we don't have good representation Representation of African Americans in those trials, we won't know if those medications are good medications for the African American community. Um, and that's why it's, it's so important. And the underrepresentation of African Americans in clinical trials leads to ongoing health care disparities, um, which is why it's so um, important. And I'm going to leave off uh, by just showing you a snippet of a film. Um, that it was produced um, through Bright Focus, which is a non-for-profit organization um, that is devoted to ocular research and Alzheimer's research. Um, the companies uh, that are represented here today, Lilly and ASI, also contribute to Bright Focus and actually contributed to the making of this film. Um, and I think Dr. Rosari may be talking about some of the other things that Bright, Bright Focus is doing um, that farm is supporting. Okay. Can we hear 55,000 people. Like many communities across America, disparities in health care have plagued this town, where until recently, brain health and dementia awareness have not been a major focus. What is Alzheimer's? Well, I couldn't <laughs> tell you exactly myself. The education of it is not very clear in our areas. Alzheimer's is a disease, a problem that 
I can't explain. Oh, Lord. Well, <laughs> Alzheimer's, so, is a delay, a um, disorder, a disease that is within the brain. It has to do with brain health, and I apologize. I don't know exactly what is Alzheimer's. I'm not sure. I've, I'm studying up on it. What is Alzheimer's? It's a form of dementia. It affects the person thinking um, what they can remember or can't remember, and it can be pretty devastating for any person and family. As a, as a layman, I would say that it's a, a, a degenerative disease of the mind that progresses uh, sometimes slow, sometimes fast, but always uh, in a miserable way. Mostly we think it's in older people. There's some young folks with Alzheimer's as well. Even though we we hear about it now, in in terms of, of how long it's been a diagnosis or a familiar term in society, that, that's only been like maybe 30 or 40 years. Where are we going? We went to the park? People of color, black and brown people, people that look like me, are at the top of the food chain with respect to dementia. Why is that so? Education is a big problem here with dementia. Education of mental issues or challenges are not something that we really readily get made aware of. We know based on research that one in four doctors have very little training when it comes to dementia education. I would love to see better relationships with the medical profession so they can be trained and how to engage with someone living with the dementia. I do believe, in my most humble opinion, that the cure is going to come out of a clinical trial. We can get African Americans in clinical trials when we actually do targeted outreach to those groups instead of doing this blanket. Hey, we told them, oh, it was on this website, but most times our people don't have access to those or they don't have the social capital or they're not connected to someone who wouldn't even know about a clinical trial. I know clinical trials are important so we can um, have better health. Basically it's a test. Clinical trial, I guess you could say it, say it is that. Would you volunteer for a clinical trial? Uh, yes, depending on what it is. I was asked to have someone come into our community to do presentations on clinical trials. But I said, let's hold off. Give me six to 12 more months because I need to educate the community just a little bit more about the basics of dementia first. We can't jump from not understanding what dementia is all the way to clinical trial. There's a second guess on whether or not we want to actually be a part of certain trials. There's a mystery. Okay. All right. So, how do I get it? Oh, there we go. Okay. So now I'd like to welcome Dr. Irizari from ASI um, to say a few words as well. Thank you so much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Michael Rosari. I'm a neurologist by background. Um, and uh, I'll spend a few minutes talking to you about, first about Azi, uh, the company that I work for and, and its commitment to Alzheimer's research. Give some background on Alzheimer's research and drug development. And then talk about the, the uh, efforts uh, that we've been undertaking to expand and African-American enrollment in Alzheimer's disease clinical trials. Um, so first of all, it, Azi is a pharmaceutical company that, that tends not to be very well known in the United States. Its uh, corporate headquarters is in Japan. It's a Japanese company. And it developed one of the first symptomatic Alzheimer's disease treatments, uh, Denepazil or Aricept, uh, over uh, around 20 years ago. Uh, its mission is to give first thoughts to patients and families and increasing the, the benefits healthcare provides. And Azi does this by working on some of the most difficult therapeutic areas, neuroscience and oncology or, or cancer. Um, and we work through collaborations, including uh, clinical trials with NIH-funded uh, groups, like the Alzheimer's Clinical Trials Consortium. Uh, we have R&D facilities in, uh, in Japan, the US, the UK that, that uh, are studying the basic science of Alzheimer's disease and trying to 
develop medications for specific targets, as I'll show you in a little bit. And then also looking at more uh, broader solutions to improve the diagnosis and care of, of Alzheimer's disease and uh, cancer. Um, and here's a, there's a picture of our, our CEO, CEO, uh, CEO Naito in, uh, from Japan. Uh, our clinical headquarters is actually just down the road in Nutley, New Jersey, so right next to uh, MetLife Stadium. Uh, research in Alzheimer's disease has really been advancing dramatically over the past 20 years with an understanding of the, the pathophysiology, the development of uh, biomarkers that allow us now to understand in living people whether they have the changes in the brain that are reflective of, of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and uh, you, I think you may have heard about this earlier today, but in terms of the understanding of what's happening in the brain in Alzheimer's disease, the, the very first changes are deposition of these plaques, uh, amyloid plaques in the brain, that can begin 10, 15, 20 years before the onset of symptoms. Uh, and these are composed of a protein that, that's called amyloid beta protein. Uh, over time, there's the development of tangles inside of nerve cells. So these brown tangles inside of a nerve cell here, or abnormal processes. That, that surround the, the amyloid plaques. Uh, and th those start uh, accumulating closer to the onset of symptoms. And then finally, there's nerve cell loss and loss of the connections between nerve cells in specific areas of the brain that cause the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. The very earliest changes, as you've, as you've heard earlier today, occurring in areas that are important for memory in, in the hippocampus. Uh, and as we learn more and more about the pathophysiology, that's helped pharmaceutical companies such as Lilly and ASI to develop specific medicines to, to try to interrupt this process and to try to either prevent Alzheimer's disease or to slow down the progression of Alzheimer's disease once it occurs. Um, so this is a, a, a bit of a complicated slide. We like complicated slides in, in the pharmaceutical industry, and this is actually simple. But it gives an example of how we, we try to model the processes that are happening in the brain and then design drugs to try to interrupt those processes. So here's a picture of two nerve cells. They're communicating via a, a synapse. Uh, the, that's the connection between nerve cells that passes information between nerve cells. There's amyloid plaques, this, this smudge here. Um, and that can uh, cause the development of tangles inside of nerve cells, these little things here. Um, and then there are other cells like microglia that are kind of the inflammatory cells of the brain. So in terms of how the researchers have tried to interrupt this process, uh, there are drugs uh, that can bind to amyloid plaques and clear them from the brain. Um, there, we're developing drugs that are trying to target the neurofibrillary tangles based on the idea that, that tangles might be spreading from nerve cell to nerve cell. And then eventually, as as the connections between nerve cells degenerate or die, we have drugs that we're trying to develop to try to preserve the, the synapses. Uh, so the, the main components of Alzheimer's disease is this early amyloid accumulation, these, the plaques that I showed before, the tangles inside of nerve cells, uh, and then finally the degeneration or the loss of nerve cells and connections between nerve cells. Uh, once we have uh, a potential drug that's been developed against these targets, the drug moves into clinical trials. And then you may have heard of the, the different clinical trial phases. Phase one, phase two, and phase three are kind of the, the most common phases. Um, so the phase one studies are typically very small clinical trials in young, healthy individuals to get the first sense of the safety of the drug, the blood level 
levels of the drug, whether the drug get, gets into the brain, things like that. Once that's been established, phase two studies are typically the first studies in patients, and they look, tend to look at different dose ranges of the study uh, of the drug and try to get the first signals of efficacy. And if there's a signal of efficacy and there's a dose that, that looks like it's working and we understand the patients that it might be most successful in, we then move into the large phase three trials. These are called pivotal trials. In Alzheimer's disease, these can have 500 to 1,000 patients, 2,000 patients within a clinical trial. And that's trying to characterize and confirm the efficacy of, of a treatment in Alzheimer's disease. And in these phase three clinical trials, it's very important to have a diverse and representative population in those studies because we want to understand whether the results of the trials will generalize. Once the, the if these trials are successful and if the drug is approved, we want to ensure that the, the people in the general population who are appropriate for the treatment will respond similar to the people that were in the clinical trial. So it's very important to have a representative group in the clinical trial with regards to race, with regards to ethnicity, with regards to other medical problems that, that people may have. Uh, so in terms of efforts that we've done to try to improve the representativeness of, of, of uh, participants in clinical trials, I highlight several of the, the initiatives that, that we've uh, implemented over the past few years. Um, so the phase three clinical trials often ha have hundreds of clinical trial sites across the U.S. and, and hundreds more across the globe. Um, and we've uh, tried to select investigators and sites that have access to diverse uh, communities, so um, who have experience working with, uh, with patients across multiple race and, and ethnic groups. Um, we've also worked with investigators to uh, have broader engagement with community centers and faith-based groups uh, to uh, provide information on, on brain health, gain trust in, and understanding about about the uh, research process and, uh, and brain health in general. And I have a list of other types of initiatives working with advocacy groups uh, that, that tries to build on that. Uh, you've also heard that, that clinical trials are an investment of, in time and effort. Um, for some clinical trials, the, the uh, drug is given by IV. Uh, for the ones that we've been working on, it's given by IV every two weeks. And that's quite a commitment for the patient, and it's quite a commitment for the caregiver. Uh, so we've been working hard to try to reduce the burden of participation in clinical trials. And one approach is to have more of the clinical trial activities be decentralized, meaning more of the clinical trial activities occurring at a person's home or close to their home, rather than having to come into a medical center or an investigation or investigational site every time. Uh, so we implemented, for instance, home infusions so people could get the, uh, their IVs performed at home. Um, they could have their cognitive testing also done remotely or at home and could have safety assessments done by phone call or video call also at home. Uh, we're also uh, looking at uh, community-based screening to uh, help people understand their, their risks for Alzheimer's disease as well as uh, ways that they can try to reduce the risk, uh, whether through healthy behaviors or exercise, uh, or whether uh, they want to participate in clinical trials. Uh, and also, we partner with advocacy organizations, uh, such as Bright Focus, that was mentioned today. Um, here's an example of a collaboration with uh, Black Health Matters uh, that's linked to our clinical trial uh, that, uh, called AHEAD 345 which is a, a trial that's trying to look at a drug that, that prevents the onset of symptoms of Alzheimer's disease in people that have evidence of amyloid plaques in the brain. 
Um, we work with multiple advocacy groups, such as Us Against Alzheimer's Disease, Bright Focus, um, local groups such as the Alzheimer's LA, LA Healthy Brain Initiative, uh, or the Dementia Alliance of North Carolina, uh, again, to, to try to um, really Im improve an understanding of brain health, risk of Alzheimer's disease, uh, and diagnosis and treatment approaches, and also opportunities to participate in research. Um, and we, we've looked uh, in detail at our Alzheimer's clinical trials to try to understand whether the um, screening criteria or inclusion exclusion criteria may be impacting the representativeness of participants that actually make it into the clinical trial. Um, and th this is uh, an analysis that we've done in collaboration with the, the Alzheimer's Clinical Trial Consortium that looked across all of our clinical trials in uh, early Alzheimer's disease. So these are uh, clinical trials of a range of different drugs uh, that uh, were recruiting people with the earliest stages of symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, patients would go through the inclusion exclusion criteria. They had to have evidence of Alzheimer's by a PET scan or a cerebrospinal fluid test, and then they could get into the clinical trial. And when we looked across uh, four studies over the, the past six years, um, and this is focused on both, both Hispanic and African American uh, uh, representation at screening and then people who actually entered into the clinical trial. We screened approximately 10,000 patients in the United States and uh, we had reasonable representation of Hispanic and black participants at the screening phase. Um, so 2% were Hispanic and black, 7% were non-Hispanic and black, so 9% overall uh, were African American, um, and then as high as uh, 25% Hispanic and white. But when we look at people that actually entered the clinical trial, we found that the, the percentages of uh, Hispanics and African Americans were less than what were screened. So more Hispanics and African Americans were screen failing for the clinical trials. And we tried to understand why that was the case. We looked at the reasons for screen failure, uh, whether it was uh, that the um, inclusion exclusion criteria about health conditions or whether it was the MRI scans that were required or the cognitive testing. And the main reason for screen failure was actually the amyloid PET test. More people that were Hispanic or African American did not have elevated amyloid in the brain. So they, they did not have Alzheimer's disease. Um, and uh, you just briefly to say we're running late on this whole session. Oh. I think you're eating into their time. Okay, so so, um, so highlighting that that we need to look at this more carefully and try to understand that there are other causes of cognitive impairment and dementia that may be treatable. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, um, increasing diversity in clinical trials is a priority to be able to generalize the results of our clinical trials to the real world population, promote fair access to investigational treatments, and to build trust in medical research institutions and therapies. So thank you for your time. Now we're gonna hear from Tony Pearson from Eli Lilly. Good afternoon. Try that again, good afternoon. <laughs> Fair. So I'll go quickly so we can, because I think the value in this is actually to hear from you and be pressed a little bit to make sure we're doing the things we need to do. My name is Tony Pearson, uh, Senior Director of Diversity and Inclusion in Clinical Trials at Eli Lilly and Company based in Indianapolis, Indiana. And so um, I have the, the fortune of being able to, to lead a team of associate directors that are aligned to each one of our therapeutic areas to ensure that our therapeutic areas are designing and operationalizing trials for those who bear the burden of the disease. Uh, in that space, I've got uh, here with me is Cameron Anderson, uh, who is a member of my team that's focused on our neurodegeneration and pain therapeutic area. Uh, at, at Lilly, um, 
We're focused really in doing that in terms of increasing diversity and inclusion in, in three ways. The first is obviously making sure that we have access or that we create access and reach for underrepresented patients. Uh, things, looking at things like our inclusion and exclusion criteria, analyzing the screen fail rates to, to ensure that we make sure that we're going back and looking at um, the criteria for, for design perspective, but also moving beyond what we consider to be rescue. So we design a trial, we operationalize that trial, we realize, oh, we've got diversity goals, and we try to go back and overcome uh, sort of enrolling those folks in the trial versus what we call uh, diverse by design and making sure that the studies are diverse in their design, that teams are aware of strategies and tactics to go out and meet these communities and drive them through, including uh, community screening. So as was mentioned, uh, we have a, a fleet of uh, mobile research units uh, and a team that's dedicated to the logistics of making sure that we can go and take trials. It's a decentralized capability, but one of our decentralized capabilities to go out and, and go to communities and be invited in by trusted partners and then maintain a, a presence consistently so it's not some sort of transaction. The first time you see us, even though we do have parallel tracks, we have trials that are ongoing now that we need to enroll, but quite honestly, it, that shouldn't be the first time you see us. right? We should be educating, we should be coaching, we should be uh, getting feedback, listening, and then sort of informing us as to what the community needs to then be able to provide that. But we, we deploy these, these uh, mobile research units all over the country, so Black Women's Expo in Chicago and uh, Women's Expo in Florida, and we can take them in anywhere across the country, uh, but again, making sure that we're in places consistently so that people see us, because if you're not from Indianapolis, you may not know us. We pull up somewhere, you see the, the red and white, and you say, are, are you Chick-fil-A? Are, are you the coffee company? That happens in communities that don't know who we are, right? So we can't assume just because we know who we are and we have this, this great portfolio and all this, that people know who we are, we've got to develop those relationships and then sustain them. So that's in the first bucket. In the second bucket, we think it unique that we're trying to make sure that we surface diverse investigators. All right, so yes, we want to find investigators in, 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 in locations, and we do demographic mapping to make sure we increase our likelihood to enroll diverse patients, but we've also got to make sure that we're tapping into diverse investigators. The statistic I usually give is that just under 6% of physicians are African American and even fewer clinical trialists, but we've still got to maximize that number for folks in our trials because of the role, the outsized role that those physicians play in their communities. At the same time, we can't solely rely on African American physicians because we know that demographically, right, they won't be able to reach all the patients that we need to reach. So they're reaching out to majority group member physicians or physicians that are different than the community that, that they're serving and empowering those folks, listening to those folks. What do they need? It may be something like an unconscious bias training for them and their staff. It may be additional resources. We particularly make sure from a community setting that we don't assume what community physicians know about the current science or what they need in terms of resource. Right? We've got to listen to those folks and then build that into our budgets to make sure we can support appropriately to empower them to go and reach diverse patients. The third piece is with respect to community outreach, engagement, and education. And so we can create all the innovation. We have decentralized tools that are that allow us to uh, make it easier for patients to, to, to sort of uh, visit with remote capabilities and the like. But the reality of the situation is we've got to be invited into to, to communities via trusted intermediaries like Dr. Gluck, right? We've got to be in the space and then we have to maintain an element of trustworthiness, again, consistently being there. And so we have partnerships with the trusted organizations like Black Health matters and, and, and a few more to be able to have campaigns that reach people in the way that they need to be reached. But we're also still listening in this phase to make sure, again, it can't just be a Black Health Matters. There's got to be other aspects because to, there's not one black community, right? There's multitude, right? I may look like someone, but if my experience is different and I'm not from Newark, right, then it may not need to be me. So who's that person? Am I tapping into that person? Am I communicating through that person and letting them tell me what we need so that we can go in and provide that? So I, I'll stop because I know we're, we're running low on time, but what I want to say here is if, if you are a, a caregiver or participating in a trial, if you feel comfortable raising your hand, could you, could you do that? Caregiver or someone living with, with Alzheimer's or, or participating. I think we have some participants here, right? The reason why I have so much hope is because, again, we have this opportunity for folks that are raising their hand after trusted relationships have been built to say we want to participate in these studies. Again, it's not us assuming in a way. It's us sort of elevating and saying, hey, we're going to give you information, but you have raised your hand. So what we're seeing more and more is that we used to get uh, clinical trial patients from predominantly from investigators referring to us. And what the, the data is actually shifting to where people are actually saying, I want to know more. I have a concern or I have a 
relationship or I have a family member and I'm raising my hand, I'm making the choice to participate in a clinical trial. How do we support that? What kind of resources are needed to support that? Same thing with uh, our, our caregivers, right? In, interacting with family members and making sure they have what they need and we're listening to those things to surface. So one. The other piece is with respect to students. So any, any folks that are in, still in school or maybe three to five years post, post graduation, if you'd raise your hand. Pardon me, I'm a lawyer by, by training, so we do Socratic method, my apologies. But I'm also inspired by you all, because what I'll tell you is this. So I'm JD, MPH, went to historically black college, Florida Agricultural Mechanical University before pursuing my JD with a concentration in health law. These problems we're solving, they, they, they've existed, but the solutions aren't there, right? We're not just plugging and playing, we're building as we're going. You're it. We're it, right? You're the medical science liaisons, right? You're designing the trials and operationalizing them, right? You're in our value of and outcomes operations, right? You're, you're, you're it. We need you so much in this space. So I'm glad that you're here in this space sort of learning and contributing because the problems that we're solving, when I go to my senior leadership, my chief science and medical officer, and he's like, hey, Tony, what do we do? I'm more than prepared to help us do that and stand this up durably. And so are you and so will you, right? You will be. So the fact that you're in this room right now, I mean, the future is bright. Obviously, we have a whole host of things that we need to overcome. I won't curse. I'm a sailor. I won't curse. But, but gosh, right, we, we, we have the ability to do this thing, and we're going to get smarter because of the folks that are in this room and delivering those things. So I'll pause with that. We can get into some questions and answers. Please press us. I've asked some folks to, to make sure they're, they're pressing us because we need to be, be, be held accountable as well. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, so any input from um, all of you would be wonderful. I've heard several times of requests for clinical people to participate in clinical trials. Uh, my question on that is, are you interested in people who actually are demonstrating some sign of the Alzheimer's disease? Oh, mm -hmm. oh thank you. I'm Marsha Riley. I wanted, I've heard several times uh, requests for people to participate in clinical trials. Are, do you want people who actually are showing signs of it or people who have none, none and are just interested in knowing more? Because I'm a part of the trial here because of a father, my father, who did have Alzheimer's. And so I was curious about learning as you old, get older. So with regard to people who are, for the, who are participating in clinical, clinical trials, do they have to show some signs of it? Have a relation? My father's dead now. Or um, they're completely healthy of it and you just want completely healthy people. What kind of people are you looking for? We're looking for you. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll just try to answer that quickly. That we're, we are looking, there are clinical trials for people who have sim, more progressed symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, but there are clinical trials for people who don't have symptoms, who may have the underlying um, a, a biomarker for Alzheimer's disease. So we've talked a lot about Alzheimer's disease today in the context context of clinical symptoms, people who have memory loss or um, loss of different functioning. To me, as a researcher, Alzheimer's disease is the plaques and tangles that we saw pictures of, right? So somebody can have plaques and tangles without any symptoms because those plaques and tangles are uh, developing over the course of decades. And if you're someone who doesn't have symptoms but may have the beginning, the buildup of plaques and tangles, there are um, experimental medications that are given, being given to that population to see if we give it early enough, can we stop the clinical symptoms from ever presenting? So some of the drugs that have been tested in people who have mild symptoms or mild cognitive impairment um, are also being tested in pre what we call preclinical Alzheimer's, which means you don't have any symptoms, um, but you may have the underpinnings. And if you could get that drug early, maybe it stops you. You, maybe that's the cure, and maybe we have the best chance of curing those people. So the answer is, regardless of where you are on the spectrum, you're potentially eligible. And even if you screen for a trial and you're not eligible, you may end up
up, depending on where you go, in a database as somebody who is interested in participating in a clinical trial, and if there's something down the road for which you may be a candidate, um, you would be contacted. Did you, any, you want to add anything to that? No. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I have a question. Um, I'm assuming that our doctors know that all hammers exist. Why can't we get um, a, a um, X-ray or MRI prior to us getting the disease itself or you know loss of memory completely? Mm. All right, I'll let someone, I'm going to pass it over, but you know the joke about assuming, right? Well, I know, I know that, yes. Okay, <laughs> but do you want to answer oh, that? Oh, you and me, I know that, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Do you want to answer? Uh, I think you're right that, that Alzheimer's tends to be diagnosed late. Primary care physicians don't really screen for cognitive impairment. People may minimize any symptoms that they're feeling. And the tests to confirm Alzheimer's disease that are currently approved like are, aren't tend not to be paid for, not to be used as the amyloid PET scans or cerebrospinal fluid, spinal tap tests. That may change over time uh, as treatments become available and, and cognitive testing or screening uh, becomes implemented earlier. And there's the development of blood tests that are looking promising that may be able to detect the changes uh, without having to do a, a PET scan or a spinal tap. So quick, quick question, what, what are your plans to understand, I'm over here to you, Yo, oh, so what are, what are your plans to understand, for example, lecanumab and how um, you know, safe and effective it is for you know, the populations that weren't represented in the clinical trial? Um. Aducanumab is um, Biogen's drug, um, but do you want to? Do either of you want to comment about um, Lakembi or Denanumab? So, in within the phase three clinical trial in, in the U.S., uh, we had underrepresentation of the African American population, about 4.5 percent in the U.S. Uh, reasonable representation of the Hispanic population, about uh, 25 percent. And with with that data, the safety and efficacy appear similar. But we we'll, we continue to study that in ongoing clinical trials, as well as. Uh, post-marketing type studies, especially studies that uh, are registries, such as the there's an ALSNET registry that's making an effort to, to recruit a more diverse population for people that are prescribed these treatments in, in the real world, as well as potential uh, electronic health records or claims-based studies that can also capture a broader population of people that are prescribed these medications. Yeah, so we'll speak about uh, Denanumab specifically, but what I, what I will say is, um, it, and it was talked about earlier with respect to the census and sort of directionally and sort of that, that is a directional sort of indication of success, which uh, is not necessarily fair, right? I think prevalence and incidence is, is, our, is our target. And so making sure that we're, again, evolving and, and it's the, the role that our team has, right, is to make sure that, that we're going back to study teams saying you're, you're, not, you're not hitting the mark. Uh, and so giving them tactics to go and reach it. But again, I think it's making sure that we're designing and then operationalizing those trials in that, in that way. It's, it becomes essential in the moment, right? It's, it's a way to make sure that we're driving health, health, excuse me, health equity, but through safety and efficacy. And so I'm seeing essentially an element of, it, it will end up being a market competition com component, right? Are you, are you able to demonstrate safety and efficacy in those communities that are affected by the disease? And either you have it or you, or you don't have it. And so that's the, the, at least the stance that we're, we're taking is we, we care to make sure that we are appropriately representing people in those trials. And when we're missing it, oh, we, we, we un understand that the, the amount of effort that's going back into making sure that, that we, we get that right. But again, it can't be solely tied to just, to, to just census data. That's not appropriate. My question is, 
Uh, going into the African American community, what is your initial approach in going into the community to recruit African Americans? And then how do you measure what drug is best for them? Instead of them looking in a magazine and seeing where you're offering a certain amount of money for them to, you know, to engage in the clinical trial, I think that there should be a better approach than to see something where we're going to offer you $500 to be in this trial. But I think there should be a better approach. And I'm wondering what type of approach do you uh, use initially to recruit African Americans? I, I just want to introduce who that was. It's Glenda Wright. Oh. And, and Glenda is our, one of our sort of three community engagement leaders who oversees all of our relationships with public and subsidized housing and does all of the recruitment yeah. in those sort of low income housing sites. Yeah. So let's have both both answer, but I Thank have you. a question for you. Yes. Do you sure. have a suggestion? Right. What should the approach be? Can I say something first? Can we hear from you all first? Yep. Yeah. And then allow her to respond. Sure. Okay, not a problem. I'm just interested in what she has to yeah. say. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that that will give us more insight. Okay. okay. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. So, so at Lilly, what we're doing is uh, a couple of different things. So right, right now we have, we're, we're in the learning mode. And so we have a partnership with an organization called the Network for Excellence in Health Innovation out of Boston. We've essentially in the state of Indiana, or the state of Indiana, uh, surfaced 30 community organizations uh, to be able to provide us with insight to identify barriers to clinical trial access that each one can partner on that if we were to overcome it would allow access. So those groups include church leaders, they include federally qualified qualified health centers and includes academic academicians, academic research institutions, as well as YMCA, Indiana Youth Group, sort of those in those spaces to better understand what their communities need to be able to go to them. It's less really about us. I think if we show up, again, we can show up, but it's like, why are you here? Why haven't you been here before? How long are you going to be here? Is it just for the, this, this particular trial for this transaction? And so what we're also doing inside of that is, is are things like this, community listening sessions to say, what do you need? It's oftentimes, if, if we're talking about a clinical trial, that's like way past where we need to be. It's sort of, how are you taking care of yourself? What's, what's your lifestyle? How do we come together to support you in that piece? Again, through whoever that trusted intermediary is. And then we can get to the options associated with clinical trials, but we've got to kind of connect to the person first through all of their lived experience experiences from a social determinants or drivers of health perspective. The other piece that we're doing is, again, making sure to, to identify um, certain organizations in, in particular states that we know are trusted and being invited, invited into those places. It would be great if someone decides to screen for a clinical trial, but candidly, it's just education and familiarity first. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to do. Well, my answer is to, to know your community and become engaged in the community and select someone that's already in the community that the people know and they trust. Yeah. Because, like the gentleman said, if you come from Boston and come into Newark and you're going to talk to uh, a lot of the residents, they don't know you. So you have to know your community. You have to do it on a, so almost like a personal level. Because when I go into a workshop and I present myself, I present myself like I know you, you know me, we, I am you. And so this is my approach. And you have to be stood on a personal level. And that's the, the basis of our recruitment. <laughs> I think we've had the most success exactly with that approach, in particular investigators that, that are engaged and trusted in their community. Hi, this is, I'm Robert Turner, and I've been grappling with a question for quite a while since I, this focus group that I, I do a lot of work in the community and I particularly focus on black men. And so the work that I do is recruiting men for um, clinical research, not clinical trials. And it was two striking things about these men that, that's, that what they said to me, and I really would love to hear from you because I have not had a satisfactory answer that I've been able to come up with on this so far. And maybe you might be able to help me, or maybe collectively can. But essentially, um, when I ask these men, um, why don't they go, one I asked, why don't you go to the doctor? And, and, and he said, 
they all said, well, every time I go to the doctor, I get bad news. So why would I go someplace where I know I'm going to get bad news, and then I'm going to go to the, the hospital, and it's going to cost me a whole bunch of stuff, and it's just, you know, cascading downhill. And so th then we asked them, we said, okay, well, if you were uh, in our group, we wanted to know who would be the most trusted source to gain information from. Um, would you want to know from a researcher like me? Would you want to know from a clinician? Would you want to know from, you know, Holly Berry? Would you want to know from somebody, you know, like that? And what they said was really important. They said, we don't want to hear from a doctor. We, because when the doctor prescribes something to us, we know that the doctor's going to make money off of it. Right, and so when I think about you coming to talk to these men, they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to let me say you need to get into a clinical trial because ultimately they're going to say they're in the business of making money off of me. So there's no reason for me to get involved with them because ultimately, even if they give me $500, they're out there to make bank. And so I'm wondering how do you approach that? How do you think about that? How do you communicate with men in this instance to help us really see that there's a bigger picture? Because for them, the big picture ultimately is how you're going to make money. Classic lawyer response, it, it depends. <laughs> But what I'd, what I'd say, and I appreciate the question, is what we've heard in our listening sessions that resonates pretty decently well is this concept of generational impact. It's the one thing that we know really well is that we have a baton, we're running our portion of the race, we're going to help make the next generation healthier. It's, it's many times, in my, in my perspective as a black male, it's easier for me to focus on my kids and in my community than it is even to focus on myself sometimes. But tapping into the component of being able to say, you're going to make it better for someone that's coming behind you, and let's explain sort of what that process is, has, has resonated. We, keep, we continue to get that piece. So even with the trust pieces, I think we, we've heard about Tuskegee and Henry Lax. It's the lack of sort of information about what a clinical trial is and then how the, the important role that at least black men get to play in helping their generation or helping their community move forward it resonates. We heard, I know that there Robert, are Robert, we're running about, we're running a bit late, so I'm going to cut you off here. I, I, need, I really do need to cut you off here. And thank you guys so much for, for your presentation. Thank you so much.